Hey everybody. How are we doing? Can you all hear me? Test, test, test. I see a thumbs up. Yeah, I can hear you. Wonderful, thank you. All right, cool. Well, it is 4.58, we'll hang out for another minute or two, and then we'll get rolling. Is Alan on here somewhere? Thinks I'm Alan. Cool. All right. Let me share my screen. Throw that there. Perfect. Got the chat bar up. Oh, we're at the end of the slideshow. That's not right. There we go. Awesome. All right. Everybody doing good this evening? I just finished a two thirds day in the clinic and raced home to chat with everybody. Let's see, we got a handful of people. What's up, Jordan? Joe? Kathleen. All right. Five o'clock. So let's get rolling. So I, I, I shortened this just a touch to try to leave a little bit of room for questions because I know last week I went a little bit long. Um, but no promises, because every time I shorten it, it tends to either go the same amount or longer. Um, so we'll, we'll just see what happens here. Um, but let's go ahead and get rolling. So last week we talked about um, we talked about kind of the physiologic basis for pain. Because really, before we can get into the treatment of our persistent pain, our centrally dominant patients, we have to dive into. Uh, we really have to kind of launch from the same platform. So last week, we, um, it's nice that normally it's like I do this lecture and then the second one comes like three months later. It's nice that they're back to back because everything should still be fresh in everybody's head. But last week we talked about kind of what pain is not and what pain is. And we really kind of built that foundation of pain and damage are two separate entities. Yes, damage can create pain. Yes, the bio is an important part of the, the equation, but there's a lot more going on. Right, and it's no longer this idea of this one-to-one -one relationship between damage and pain where we have to remove the foot from the fire, so to speak, but it's this complex interrelationship between information that comes in from our body, information that comes in from our periphery, and then this, this conversation between lots of different parts of our brain that are involved in lots of different um, experiences. And in that conversation, that back and forth between all these areas, that is what creates, that's what makes the decision whether it's is based on the environment that I'm in and the information coming from my periphery is what's going on something that is important enough that it should draw my attention and I need to change my behavior to protect myself from it or is it not? If the answer is yes, then we create that sensory and emotional experience um, that we know is pain. So we think about um, kind of that, that boiled down model that, that uh, Louis Gifford gave us. It was this. The equation is information from the the tissues plus information from the environment plus information from the internal context. If those three things are important enough that I need to avoid it, then the output is pain based on all these things. As simple as that. 
So when we think about that, when we think about what pain is, then, then it starts to make sense how, how we have to treat these patients just a little bit differently. But then we took it one step further, right? This is how pain behaves normally. This is, what's, um, this is what normal adaptive pain looks like. And this is important. We should be able to experience pain to avoid things that we don't, right? If the kid doesn't feel pain when he puts his hand on the stove the first time, he's going to put it on there again, right? So pain is an important adaptive feature of the human that's going to survive. Now with persistent pain, something, something doesn't go right in this equation. There's a change. There's something that occurs where we shift from protecting ourselves from things that we need protected from to our nervous system flips to hover parent mode where we have these maladaptive neuroplastic changes in parts of our brain, parts of our, parts of our dorsal horn and our central nervous system that shift our ability to shut down the information coming up from the periphery and only let through what's important to this, this overriding excitation of everything, where we shift into the state of chronic widespread pain, of allodynia, of hyperalgesia, of inability to locate sensory information, of lack of proprioception and kinesthesia, of all kinds of bi-directional stuff, like depression and anxiety and stress and um, sleep dysfunction. And all of these things work together and have all of these health consequences and all of them drive pain forward. So it's much, much more complex and there's something different in the persistent pain brain than in the acute pain brain. And that's kind of where we left it, was here. This idea that um, when we think about the patient with pain, there's all this stuff going on. We've got our internal context, our peripheral dysfunction and our external contextual factors, right? Those are the three things of the mature organism model. And there's lots of levers in there that we can pull to sort of adjust that calculation. And traditionally, we tend to think about treating pain just from that left upper box, that peripheral dysfunction. We look at everything like a biomechanical thing, taking the foot out of the fire. So we just get in and, and do that stuff. But if we can just expand it to those top three, we can change some stuff. But then if we back out and we look at the whole person, we look at that person with persistent pain, that centrally dominant pain, that, that nervous, uh, nervous system dysfunctional pain, there's some other stuff in there that's going on, right? We have those maladaptive neuroplastic changes in the cord, in the cortex, prefrontal cortex, somatosensory motor cortex, brainstem, midbrain, all those areas that are involved in higher order planning and fear and fear extinction and anxiety and depression and past experiences and motor planning and all of that stuff. We have changes in the structure there that can drive the pain. So we have to be thinking about how do we measure that and how can we treat that. We have stuff that goes on at the dorsal horn where, where we have a lack of ability to shut down pain or shut down those signals before they come up. Um, and then we have these bi-directional stuff, all of these, these stepping back and taking the 10,000 foot view of the patient, looking at sleep and stress and depression and activity levels and diet and social interaction and all of these different things each individually have bi-directional relationships with pain and have bi-directional relationships with each other. And as we start to collect dysfunction in these spheres, all of them feed off each other and, and sort of um, amplify each problem. So we've got to make sure that we're looking at ways to treat that as well. There's a lot of stuff there. And obviously we can't do all it. We can't dive deep into each of these things in the next, in the next 30 minutes, um, next 45 minutes. But what I want to focus on is I want to talk um, a little bit about ways to get after internal context, a little bit about ways to get after some of the maladaptive neuroplastic stuff, and then spend the, the, a chunk of our time looking at ways to set up treatments around addressing some of these bi-directional factors because this kind of the once we get to that sphere the magic lives in in kind of that stepping back and looking at the total health of the whole human how do we affect that so before we can dive into that um, we got to start here um, because not all pain is the same and this classification system, and I'm not a huge fan of classification systems, but I, I sort of like kind of it started with Keith Smart's work. And um, I know we've changed the terms a bit. Now we're talking about nociceptive versus uh, neuropathic versus nociplastic or nocefensive. The words have changed a little bit, but the definitions have always stayed the same. And I kind of like, eh, call me old fashioned, I, I, I like where it started the best. So when we think about pain, it's, it's dominated from one of three regions, one of three spheres. 
first is nociceptive pain, nociceptive dominant stuff. This is the acute ankle sprain, the acute back sprain, the, the, the traumatic injury, the thing that, that we've activated nociceptors and they've immediately caused pain. And it's from that high threshold thermal mechanical inflammatory information coming into the body and it's enough to, to make a painful experience. And this is traditionally sort of how we've evaluated and treated everything. And then you've got your peripheral neuropathic pain. This is pain that's caused by damage to the peripheral nervous system. Think about a whiplash. Think about that, that neck-related arm pain or that back-related leg pain. That's, um, that, that pain that kind of lives in that dermatomal cutaneous pattern that is susceptible to neurodynamic tensions or things like that. Um, that's peripheral neuropathic sphere. And it would be evaluated and treated very differently than a nociceptive patient. And then last, and the one that we're gonna focus on today is the centrally sensitized patient, the centrally dominant patient. This is the defined as pain that's initiated or caused by dysfunction in the central nervous system. But that's all the stuff that we talked about in the maladaptive pain section of, of last week, where we have changes in the way the central nervous system functions that has now enhanced and spread uh, the pain experience. And again, we're gonna look at, evaluate and treat this patient differently than the other two. So Keith Smart gave us those definitions from a Delphi study in 2010 and then kind of had this expert consensus on what are the dominant features of each of these different types of pain. And then he took those features and then did a secondary analysis on a big cohort of back pain patients and kind of ran all that stuff through a regression analysis to figure out what are the most important features of each of these things that would make us, you know, when, when we look at the patient, what's going to give us the most information as whether this is nociceptive, peripheral neuropathic, or centrally dominant. And it looked like this. If the patient walks in the door and their pain is localized to a specific area that had a specific trauma to it, if their ags and eases make sense with this with mechanically and anatomically, if the pain is typically described as, you know, it's sharp with movement or loading, but you know, if I'm off of it, if I'm kind of resting, it's, it's more of a dull ache. There are no nerve symptoms. We don't have that paresthesia. We don't have that pain down the arm or whatever. And there's no night pain or disturbed sleep, right? This, if, if those five things are on board, it's 10 times more likely that this patient is, is predominantly nociceptive than peripheral neuropathic or centrally dominant. The patient that walks in the door with these three things, you know, a history of a nerve injury, right? So we've got like a brachial plexus traction or, or um, you know, I picked up a box in my garage, I felt a pop and then I had this, this screaming leg pain or, or whatever, you know, that, that, that thing that makes sense or I'm a, I'm a server and I'm in this position all the time or I type all the time or, or something that mechanically compromises um, a peripheral nerve. Pain that lives in that dermatomal or cutaneous nerve pattern. That looks like an L4 on chart. Um, pain or symptom that's, uh, that you can provoke with like a neurodynamic tension test or a phalens where we're pulling the nerve or um, a compression test or a tenel where we tap it and we get some zingers. Like if we, can, if we can ding the nerve and it's sensitive to mechanical stress, um, if those three things are on board and we're 20 time, 21 times more likely that we're dealing with a peripheral neuropathic patient than nociceptive or central. With the central patient, if their pain provocation stuff doesn't make sense, right? And we have these patients, everything hurts, nothing helps. And it's sometimes bending sucks, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I can sit for like three minutes, but then on that fourth minute, it sucks. But minute seven, it's kind of normal. And then I stand up and it's good and it's bad. And, you know, it just, there are days that, that everything is different, right? We hear that all the time with these patients. And that's a normal defining feature of centrally dominant pain. Pain that persists past normal expected tissue healing times. This started in 2003. It's now 2020. That disc, whatever, should have been healed. It's a widespread, non-anatomical pain, right? This is a patient that you look at the body chart that they filled out in the, in the waiting room, and it looks like they, they just grabbed it and scribbled everywhere, right? That is not, what, what dermatome is that pattern, right? It shouldn't make sense from how we're taught pain behaves in school. They'll also have strong association with maladaptive psychologic factors. Well, yeah, you know, my back and my neck hurt all the time and, and my mother-in-law just moved in and then that got worse and I'm fighting at home. And, and like when you start to hear the story, it's, it, it's, not, it's not just physical stuff. We start to hear other things get tied into that. And then there's going to be, there's typically a history of failed interventions. For those of you that treat persistent pain now, 
how many of your five-year back pain patients, your 10-year neck pain patients that you've met that haven't had physical therapy that failed before? Or chiropractor or acupuncture or the physician or whatever, right? They have a long history of things that have not gone well from a getting you better standpoint. If these five things are on board, we're 40 times more likely that we're dealing with a patient that is centrally dominant versus peripheral neuropathic or nociceptive, right? So this is the stuff that, that, that's going to start to, it's not like a hard and fast rule, but this is going to start to kind of guide this idea that, okay, centrally dominant is high on my hypothesis list, and that's going to change the things that I'm going to look at from an objective standpoint. So just to kind of contrast these two, we all know how to look, we all know how to measure and evaluate and pull out key objective, objective asterisks in our nociceptive patients. But when we think about the peripheral neuropathic patient, you know, this is the stuff that we're going to look at. These are the, these are the, the single nerve neuropathic patients, right? So we're going to do that neuro screen. And if it's an upper limb, we're going to look at grip strength stuff. We're going to be looking at dermatomes and myotomes and DTRs and things like that. We're also gonna have the patient demonstrate the things that bring on the symptoms. Show me the position that makes your arm flare up or your leg pain. Does it centralize? Does it peripheralize? Can we change it with repeated movements, sustained postures, lateral shift corrections, things like that? What do our neurodynamic tension tests look like? What does it look like when I put the nerve on stretch? What is your, what is your joint and soft tissue stuff feel like around that nerve chain compared to the opposite side? We can palpate nerves, right? We know that, that nerves tend to be really round. They feel a little bit stiffer. We can get in and like, we can feel that median nerve in here. I can get in here and feel right where that, yep, that's it right there, where that's, um, that ulnar nerve comes through that groove. And then if I get in there and I put pressure on it, can you feel that in your fingers? Is that painful to touch here? Is the pain pressure threshold over this nerve bed different than this nerve bed? What if I tap it, flick it? Do we get zingers? How does that compare to the other side, right? Those are the things that we'll look for in the peripheral neuropathic patient. For our centrally dominant patient, we're going to look at things like where, where does that allodynia exist? As I slide my thumbs down your back and you start to jump over here, is it the same as over here? What is the shape of that region of allodynia? How big is it? Does this change over time? What's your pain pressure threshold like in that region versus your shoulders versus your thighs? Pain pressure threshold is such a magic objective comparable for this, uh, this patient population. What does your movements look like? Your ability to move versus your willingness to move, right? I'm not, I, I mean, range of motion is, it is what it is. It's not super important. What's more important to me, let's say we're looking at John who's got chronic back pain. John, let me see you bend forward. And John bends like this. Or John, let me see you bend forward. And John bends like this. Both of them gave me about 30 degrees of flexion, but there was a big difference in what this looks like and what this looks like and what those tell me. Do we have maladaptive guarding on board? Do you have the ability to reverse? John, you stopped right there. What stopped you? Well, if I go any further, it hurts. Cool. Or, John, what stopped you there? If I go any further, I know it's gonna hurt. And that gives us two wildly different pieces of information too that will guide some treatment. I'm also gonna look at pain behaviors, right? What do they do as they move? Do they grimace? Do they breath hold? Do they grunt? Do they make noises? Do they walk up their legs? Like what are the behaviors parry to the pain? And are these things that, that are important to draw attention to so that we can start to tease those circuits apart? We're also gonna look at laterality, left, right discrimination. Um, and because we know that in patients that have lots of neuroplastic changes in somatosensory cortex and areas of the brain that, that create our body representation, we lose our abilities to tell the difference between left and right. Um, and two-point discrimination. There are some, some poorly established, but they exist, norms for different parts of the body. We know low back, you should be able, at about 55 millimeters, you should be able to tell the difference between, or the, between like, so below 55 millimeters, this should feel like one point as I touch you, but above that, you should be able to tell that these are two points. And a lot of our persistent pain patients, I, I have a, my two point, here, right here. My calipers, um, they go up to 150. So this is 55 right here. And they go up to 150, which is that. And I've had many patients that can't tell when I touch their back with this, that that's two separate things, 
right? That tells us that our ability to tell where sensation is coming from is really messed up. And that should be something that we can track and that we can treat, right? So those are some of the things that I'm gonna look at objectively. I wanna talk a little bit about how we, how we can go about changing those here in a minute. But the last piece before we dive into treatment stuff is this. While it's cool to think about the different spheres of pain, understand that nothing exists in it. There's no such thing as a centrally dominant patient or a nociceptive patient, a peripheral neuropathic patient. All of our patients will have aspects of all of these things. The key is that um, our goal here is to identify what are the most dominant features of your pain? What are the most important things? The patient that comes in that has pain over their whole body, everything hurts, nothing helps, everything's super sensitive, and they've got a positive straight leg raise. Yeah, they've probably got some neurodynamic stuff going on, but day one, that's probably not the most important thing. The most important thing is probably identifying why their central nervous system is so ramped up and what we can do to drive that down a little bit. Versus the patient that walks in that has 9 out of 10 back-back related leg pain that centralizes with extension and is a little bit afraid of their back. Um, I'm not, and, and has had PT before and failed or whatever. Like, yeah, they've probably got a little bit of nervous system ramp up, but that's not the most important thing going on right now, right? The most important thing is to be addressed to let, let's get after that neuropathic dysfunction and then maybe we can circle back around on the other stuff. So just having a really good understanding of your patient and figuring out what is the most important thing today? What is the thing that we're probably gonna be most likely to address early on that we're gonna see changes in an objective measure early on so I can show the patient that things are changing? What are the things that the patient feels are important? What are the things that the patient is going to be willing to work on right away? And then taking all that information and figuring out what is the most important thing to attack right now. And that's sort of where we're going here, right? So the idea is that when we think about the centrally dominant patient, um, we're going to take kind of all that stuff that we talked about last week and, and really from a, from a sound neurophysiologically based, psychologically informed practice. How do we get in and change your internal context in a way that turns down the volume of the system so that we can use kind of a top-down approach to get you to a more healthier state? I love how Louis Gifford puts it. He says that our goal is to promote the return of physical confidence. And that's a really important thing to think about. Our patients that have had pain for 10 years, that have seen a million different primary care physicians and pain management specialists and orthopedics and had surgery shots, injections and RFAs and acupuncture and chiropractor and PT 17 different times, why in the hell would they have any confidence? Everything has failed, nothing has helped, I get worse every year, my body is fragile, it's the only thing anybody tells me, why would I have any confidence in my ability to improve or confidence in my body itself, right? So we have to change that belief. The other thing is the idea of re the restoration of thoughtless, fearless movement. And again, if we think about that back pain patient that's wa that walks in the door that we have seen that, that has had this going on for 10 years, and this is the patient that's been ro log rolling since 1983, and they come in and, and you say, all right, John, let me see you pick that up off the floor. And what does John do? He goes, John, what are you doing? Well, I gotta, so I gotta get my pelvis neutral, and then I'm gonna turn on my, yeah, there it is, my TRA is set. Okay, multifidus is on, hands close to my body, bend my knees, keep my back, right? That's how patients that have been in pain for a long time have been trained to move. That is not, if I say, if I ask you, Kathleen, right now to pick something up off the floor, what are you gonna do? Just gonna pick it up. You don't think about it. You don't, you're not afraid of your back, right? Thoughtless, fearless movement is how normal, adaptive humans move. And all of that extra stuff is stuff that has been trained into humans that create maladaptive movement patterns, fear, and maladaptive um, motor pattern firing. So the, his idea is that we have to reverse all of that stuff. All right. So let's get into some of the treatment stuff. Now, again, the, 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 the patient that we're talking about, the patient that's predominantly centrally sensitized, you know, their chart looks like this, right? Their, their pain's everywhere. Um, and we've got that kind of that burning, throbbing, agonizing, um, more affective descriptors of pain. Their pain is a million out of 10. And that is clearly not a dermatomal pattern. A lot of them are higher irritability. Um, and, and they can't give us a clear idea of, Ags versus right? This is our typical centrally dominant patient. 
and it's difficult because it's, you know, what do we, what do we measure with these patients? But if we think about that, that little chart I put up, you know, this is a beautiful patient to, to watch them move a little bit, get a baseline for, for their willingness and ability for gross movements, and then get in and look at two-point discrimination, get in and look at pain pressure thresholds and things like that, because those are the objective measures that are going to change early on that we can now start to get buy-in from these patients. So, I said I want to kind of focus on three of those six spheres, and we're going to talk about treating the internal context. And this is, remember, when we think about the, the physiology piece, that internal context, that, that prefrontal and nasolimbic cortex, where all of that psychosocial stuff lives, has that strong connection with that midbrain, that has that powerful connection with the dorsal horn and the spinal cord, and those on-off cells in the midbrain. And this is the area that when things start to get funky, we shift from descending inhibition to that maladaptive facilitation of everything. So we have to get after treating their internal context stuff, addressing the yellow flags, getting after the psychosocial stuff. And we're sort of gonna get this through two, two functions are gonna get us there. And both of these things feed off each other. First one is education. We have to teach the patients about the physiology of pain and about kind of what's going on a little bit so that they understand themselves a little bit better, which is going to build our therapeutic alliance. The better our therapeutic alliance, the more they're going to trust us, the more they're going to relax, the more they're going to feed into the education piece. We think about maladaptive neuroplastic changes. Um, we're going to be, again, these kind of correlate with changes in motor and sensory and cortical maps, change in the prefrontal cortex. And these have that whole host of um, all those uh, increased pain, increased pain sensitivity, why, uh, increased pain region, uh, proprioceptive deficits, kind of all of those things live in this region. And we're going to treat that through, through using a technique called graded motor imagery, which we'll talk about here in a second. And when we think about graded motor imagery, the big key with changing some of this stuff is neuroplastic change occurs through focused repetition, not just repetition. So this, they have to be cognitive tasks where we get specific circuits in the brain to fire in specific ways. And then last, we need to get after our bi-directional relationships. And again, this is going to be that 10,000 foot view of the patient where we're going to really look at what are all the dysfunctional spheres in their life and how, what, are the, what are the things that we can do to really promote as much of a concept of total health for this patient as possible. Um, and we're going to get after this through, through technique called graded exposure. And we're going to have kind of two types of graded exposure. Graded exposure to specific movements and graded exposure to... Um, global activities. And we'll, we'll pick apart some of these here a little bit towards the end. So first, when we think about internal context, again, this is, this is going after our education therapeutic alliance treatment techniques. But really what we need to do is assess for yellow flags. We have to figure out what are the patient's beliefs and expectations, their fears, their anxieties, what's going on in their brain that are barriers to treatment or creating physiologic change that drives facilitation of pain from the periphery. Some nice ways to objectively measure some of this stuff are pain catastrophizing scale, kinesiophobia scale, start back tool, or barrow. There's a lot of ones out there. Um, what I would say is that when we think, I'm a big fan of the pain catastrophizing scale. Um, the, it has a rumination subscale. A lot of our persistent pain patients have ruminating personalities. And what's, you know, ruminating personality, what is that? You know, that's, you know, you're, you're constantly checking in, you're constantly thinking about a thing, you know, like if I had an argument with my wife this morning on the way out the door, you know, I'm, I'm going back to that argument all day long and ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. And after eight hours of work, I come home and kick down the door and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get through this thing. Um, you know, that, that ruminating personality. Patients with pain, they ruminate on their pain. So what are they doing? Their, their focus repetition, repeating their pain circuit all day long in their brain. So if we can find ways to draw patients' attention to the fact that they do this, then it opens up the avenue for conversations around changing this stuff. So I love, um, I love the PCS because they have that subscale. And, um, and I typically find that with most of my persistent pain patients through the door, all of them bottom out that, uh, that, that rumination subscale. We'll say this. We think about these scales. Um, I don't really care too much about the scores. To me, the real value in this stuff is the conversation it elicits. I send this stuff home for homework, and then when the patient brings it back in the next session, we sit down, we go through each item. I say, John, on this one, you mark three. 
you know, why, why is this a three? Explain that to me. What would it look like if it was a five? What would it look like if it was a one? What would need to change for you to feel differently about item number seven? Like stuff like that. So I can really get a good understanding of their beliefs and then start to show the patient that these things are important and get them to think about how we might go about changing them. Because we're going to talk about some of this stuff a little bit later. And if I've already kind of preloaded in their head, they're going to have answers to some of the questions we ask down the road. And then the rest of this stuff is just going to come out of the subjective exam. I'm a big fan of the bar school story, especially with these patients. Tell me why you're here. And if John wants to start with the horse and buggy accident in 1912, that's great. That's important. If it's important to you, it's an important part of the story. I have to hear it. So I get to understand your beliefs about what's going on, your expectations. And we got to ask a lot of good questions here. You know, it's been going on for a long time. You've had a lot of treatment. What's gone well? What's gone poorly? What do you think? Why did that help? Why did that not help? Why do you think you're only getting worse? What do you think you need? What do you think you need to change in your life? What do you think you need from me? Like, this is the kind of stuff that I want you to start answering. And a lot of times they're saying, I don't know, you're the doctor. This is why I'm here. And that's totally fine on the front end. But I just want to start getting you as a patient to start thinking about some of this, some of the why as to why you're here and what you expect. And that also gives me some information on your beliefs and sort of where you live on this, this internal versus external locus of control and self-efficacy stuff. From an education standpoint, our goal is, is simple. We have to create a narrative that validates the patient's experience because nobody's ever done that for them. Then the story that we, that, we, that we have has to normalize their symptoms. They have to understand why they feel the way they do. If we can tackle those two goals, it's gonna reduce their fear and threat a little bit, which is gonna change that mature, mature organism model equation, which is going to start to, to crack open the door a little bit that gives us a bit of an opportunity to move function forward. That's all we're after. So it's not just about pain stuff, right? Patients don't have to understand physiology of pain at the level that we do. We have to understand it that way so that we can listen to the patient's story, listen to the words they use, listen to their symptoms, and create a story that makes sense to them in their words and their term that knock out the first two boxes on that list. So we can, we can talk about pain, we can talk about their beliefs, their negative expectations, their mindsets, their anxiety, their depression, their diet, whatever. Um, anything that we feel is important to changing their stuff, um, we can get in and educate about that. We have to make sure that we match that to the patient, we just talked about that. But the most important thing is this, when we, talk, when we think about educational interventions, we tend to, um, we tend to come in with all guns blasted, right? Took this course over the weekend. I, I, I learned all this really cool physiology stuff and patient at 9 a.m. is going to hear it all. When we look at a patient, I really want us to think about psychological interventions the same way we think about physical interventions. Doris comes in. Doris is an athlete. Doris has got some back pain, but Doris is strong and she's no stranger to moving load. I'm going to have to put some load on her. We're going to, maybe we might deadlift a hundred pounds. I might throw some weight on the bar and watch her squat and see what she looks like under tension to figure out what's going on. John is not an athlete. John hasn't loaded his body in a decade. John, um, if, we threw, if we threw the bar on his back and told him to squat, it'd be a disaster, right? We're going to start him somewhere else. We're good at figuring that out with patients physically but we tend to load the bar for everybody from an educational standpoint. We wanna make sure that we're, we're figuring out where the patient's at, meet them where they are, and then slowly build the education over time, just like we would with any other physical intervention. Does that make sense? I'm gonna look at the screen for some head nods. All right, I see, yeah, there we go. I'll we'll cue you for the head nods, beautiful. <laughs> All right, and then I love this quote right here. The patient that learned, there's another, yeah, I love Louis Gifford stuff. The patient that learned from their pain explained therapist that their pain didn't really matter, who suddenly got out of the chair, went home, went riding their bike for the first time in five years, just doesn't exist. Ladies and gentlemen, education is not a standalone intervention. We have a ton of studies to tell us that when we look at education versus anything else, it doesn't do anything. It cracks the window. It, 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 it gives us just a little bit of an opportunity to start moving some stuff forward, right? It's important and we're gonna do more and more throughout the session, but it's only as good as the thing that happens next. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about um, this here. Let me switch the screens here. Uh, if I click on this, yeah. 
Boom. Where'd it go? Uh-oh. All right, let me try that one more time. New share. Whiteboard. Huh, that's not working. All right, one more second here. Oh, there it is. All right, can we see this whiteboard thing here that I just drew a weird line on? Okay, cool. So what I tend to do, I have a, I have a little whiteboard in my office, um, in the eval room, and on the kind of my baseline explaining pain to a patient, we'll, we'll typically, it, it varies, but, but the, the foundation, the start point kind of always looks like this. Um, here we go. So it starts like this. I'm a really terrible drawer. I find that the worse my drawings are, the easier it is for me to get the patient to laugh a little bit. And if I can get the patient to laugh while I'm doing this, it's probably the most therapeutic thing I did session one. Um, but I'll say, okay, that's an alarm. This is a graph. This is your nervous system. There's always information going on here. And then I'm walking across the floor, I'm walking across the floor, and step on a Lego, twist my ankle, sprain it, boom. I get enough information in the nervous system that I trip this line, the alarm goes off. And then what happens? Sprain my ankle pretty good. And for the next day, the alarm's always going off. And then tomorrow, you know, I wake up, it doesn't hurt all the time, but man, as soon as I put a little pressure on it, boom, alarm goes off. A few days later, you know, I can walk on it a little bit, but if I walk on it for more than like 10 or 15 minutes, alarm goes off. A few days later, you know, we're down here. I can walk all day, but if I run or jump, it goes here. And you get the point, right? As, as things start to heal, the sensitivity in the system goes back down and down and down. And each time it drops, it creates more and more space for us to live and do stuff. Now, sometimes we've had pain for a long time. Um, and, and there's lots of reasons why, but, but essentially what happens is sometimes you just get stuck here. Nervous system never comes back down. Maybe you dip down a little bit, but it doesn't take you much to get back up here. And when you've had pain for long enough, you're in pain all the time, and that pain starts to spread. And at this point, the patient's starting to kind of like nod at me, like, yeah, they get this. Now, John, there's lots of reasons why. And I listened to the subjective, so I heard lots of different things in his story. But, you know, you hurt your back a while ago. And there's probably some, you know, you've got that MRI, and there's some discs and some, some damage on that MRI. And it's, it's probably contributing. And there's probably a little bit of stuff going on in there because of that. You're not sleeping real well. You've been on these pills for a long time, and we know that changed the nervous system a bit. You told me your diet's no good, and we know that that can be a thing. You're not doing any physical activity. Um, you haven't been out of your chair in years, and we know that that does some stuff. Right, so what I'm going to do is start to tie in some of these bi-directional things to things that drive the nervous system up. And then, John, our goal is to take you from here and find different things that we can do, different things that we can attack to start driving that nervous system down a little bit, a little bit, a little bit over time to kind of open up more and more space for more and more life. Right, and that's, that's usually kind of my foundational explanation of pain. Um, there's a couple different directions that I take this next, which I'm, we're going to pull out a little bit later in the lecture, but this is just sort of where we're going to start. All right. Let me get rid of that. Take us back to the slides. Beautiful. Okay. Now, that's kind of the beginning of explaining pain. I want to talk just for a second about this. So explain pain, again, like there's lots of, when we look at the systematic reviews, there isn't a lot of good evidence that education the standalone does a whole lot of stuff. But there is some research out there to show us some, some of the things that it does do in the short term and the long term. Lowe in 2014 and 16 had this really cool study where he took patients that had back, back related leg pain that were getting a lumbar radiculop, or a, a surgery for a lumbar radic, microdiscectomy, split them into two groups, First group got the surgery. Second group got a 30 minute session, just talking about giving them a little bit of physiology of pain, give them some, some what to expect going into the surgery, what they're gonna feel like after the surgery, what they're gonna feel like down the road and how that makes sense from a physiologic standpoint. Tracked them for three years. The first thing was their pain or disability was no different, right? And there was no difference in the rehab between the two groups other than one got a little bit of pain science, one didn't. But the thing that was interesting is that over three years, the group that had a better understanding of their physiology 
had decreased, uh, had increased surgical satisfaction, had less healthcare utilization, less MRIs, less visits to the doctors, less medication use, less cost overall, which tells us that they had increased self-efficacy. They understood their bodies better. They were more in control of their stuff. So they were seeking care less. That's super powerful. Self-efficacy, one predicts um, exercise in the amount of activity humans are going to do. It also predicts um, a lot of health stuff and longevity and things like that. So anytime we can improve self-efficacy, that's a huge win. This is a fun one. This is just a, a single patient, chronic low back pain, um, and abdominal hollowing was a painful, painful technique for them, right? So they threw them in the fMRI machine and had them do an abdominal hollowing technique, and that's the slides we see on B there. And then they gave them a few minutes of uh, Mosley. This is this is what pain is. This is what it's not. This is some analogies. Blah blah blah. Now throw them back in the fMRI machine. Have them do it again. They had decreased pain. And then they had significant changes in brain activity. All those areas of the brain that are active during the experience of pain were silent. The circle on the C, that's your primary motor cortex, which you don't see firing in B. And that showed us that, that one, we shut down the pain circuits, and two, we turned on the motor circuit. And any time that you can fire the motor minus the pain, that's an opportunity to groove that in and start to reverse some of that neuroplastic change. So that's some cool stuff. But again, remember that it's only as powerful as what comes next, right? So now I wanna move into this, this maladaptive neuroplastic sphere for just a minute, and then we'll dive into the next piece where I think a lot of the magic lives. So again, kind of coming off of that idea, that focused repetition, that idea of trying to get parts of your brain to fire without other parts of your fire, to parts of your brain to fire. Because remember, when we talked about neuroplastic change, it's those circuits that fire in focused repetition together in unison all at once, they consolidate, become one thing. So with pain and flexion and pain and flexion and anxiety and pain and flexion and depression and anxiety and pain and flexion, as all those things fire a bunch of time over time, or a bunch of times over time, they consolidate, become one circuit. So we have to find ways to try to get those things to fire apart so that that circuit becomes unconsolidated and goes back to being multiple things. We're gonna do this through getting after graded motor imagery. Um, the idea is that we wanna to try to activate some of those sensory and motor maps without activating pain maps or pain behavior maps, right? This is where I'm gonna to start to try to separate some of that breath holding, grimacing, and things like that from their, from their movement patterns. The idea is that we're sharpening up some of those smudged maps or that, that those maladaptive neuroplastic changes in the somatosensory cortex. By providing focused repetition in a non-painful, non-threatening environment, right? So we're gonna do this three, three phases. This is looking at first, at, at the very lowest level, laterality or left-right discrimination change, or training. We know that let's say a patient that has a left-sided CRPS in their arm. If we show them a bunch of pictures of left hands and right hands, um, and, and they have to identify you know, right, left, right, left, they're going to get this one right 80, 90% of the time. They're going to get this one right 40, 50% of the time. Like their brain loses its ability to identify left versus right. Because when you look at a picture, how your brain figures out which, if that's left or right, it actually fires up the, the motor or the kind of the sensory pattern of your left hand and then matches it to the picture. And if it matches, it says, yep, that's left. If it doesn't match, it switches and says, okay, that's probably right. But if that, if that body schema representation is jacked up in your head, you lose the ability to identify what those things look like. There's a bunch of different apps for measuring this. I like the Recognize app because it's, it makes it easy to use it as a training tool. Um, it does cost money. I think it's like five or six bucks per body part. I just bit the bullet, paid for all of them, loaded up on an iPad that sits in the office. And, um, and I will use that frequently to measure. Um, and then if they're, if they're low on that, if they're less than 80% on the side, neck, back, arms, whatever, um, then I'll create um, a laterality training program. The next is motor imagery. So if they're good at laterality, then we can move into motor imagery, right? And motor imagery is as creative as you want it to be. On the very lowest end, it looks like this. Right, John, picture your right hand in this position. Now in this position. Now in this position. Or neck or back or whatever. And then from there, you know, I want you to picture moving from here to here. 
And then, you know, I want you to close your eyes, take a deep breath, raise your right hand, exhale, raise your right hand, exhale. Now imagine your left hand moving with your right hand. And then we can actually move that into movement or we can do some motor imagery around sports or things like that. But we should be able to imagine specific movements or functional movements without increasing pain. If they have symptom increase, then we can, we can kind of scale down the difficulty or the, the time spent. But if we can get through complex motor imagery without increasing symptoms, then we can move into mirror box stuff. This is where people kind of mess up. We jump right into mirror stuff. You can't do mirror box training if the first two aren't clear. And I'll show you a study that talks about that in a second. And we all know what mirror box stuff is, right? So John's got some right arm stuff. We'll put him in a mirror where he can only see his left side. But since it's mirrored, we see our right side. So we can move our left hand, our brain sees our right side in the mirror move. And what, what occurs there is that we have these things called mirror neurons, that when we witness a thing move, our brain will fire the premotor and presensory uh, parts of our brain to match that movement. So we're actually, if we can do the mirror box training in a way that our brain has the ability to recognize left from right, laterality is clear, and it doesn't increase symptoms, then what we're doing is firing those parts of our brain that control movement sensory without firing the pain circuit. And then location and sensory discrimination training. This is a thing that I do um, in phase one and two, and we'll talk about what that looks like here in a second. I wanna jump into this real quick. Uh, Mosley and Bowering showed us that if we take, if we do it in that order, or if we randomly do it, when you do it in order, it, it is far more effective than, than randomly ordered GMI. And it makes sense because if we think about it from a cognitive load standpoint, if we were to look at an fMRI while you do these tasks, laterality takes very little cortical activation. Motor imagery takes a little bit more. And then mirror training is gonna more intensely use much more of your brain region. And if you just think about that backwards, if your brain doesn't have the ability to identify the difference between left and right, it is going to be wildly confused by what's going on when you look in a mirror. So you want to make sure that those two first phases are clear before you move into that third one. All right. Talk about this for just a second, and then I want to dive into the great exposure stuff, which I think is where, where a lot of the magic lives. So sensory discrimination training. Um, this is, uh, again, I do this in phase one and two. Uh, Adrian Lowe had a nice case series on this, but basically what they did is took patients with chronic back pain and just assumed that since they had chronic back pain, we have some changes in that somatosensory cortex where our brain doesn't know where information is coming from the body. They didn't measure laterality or two-point discrimination, but this would have been a good place to do it. And then he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. When you've had pain for a while, your body loses its ability to know where information is coming from your periphery. So we're just going to retrain that. I'm gonna, we're gonna imagine this grid on your back and I'm gonna touch these spots. And I typically start with a little bit smaller grid, but say he goes, um, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six. Now I'll touch it, you say it, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now let's randomize it. One, one, three, three, five, five, and like that. So we're, we're getting focused repetition of, of where information is coming from the body. What he found is that he had immediate improvements in pain and forward flexion. So we said, if we can improve movement without actually having patients move, this is a nice way to get after some of that uh, separating the movement um, from the pain circuit. I love using this stuff with my patients with chronic pain, especially patients with allodynia. I'll teach them how to do it. I'll videotape it. I'll send it home with them and have them do it with a partner, loved one, um, kids, whatever. And then we can change the size of that grid, right? Patients that their two-point discrimination is terrible, 150, 170, four boxes might be enough that are spread way apart. Um, as they get better, we might move to six. As they get better, we can, we can shrink the size of the grid. My goal is for them to fail you know, like 70% of the time. Or no, sorry, my, my goal is for them to succeed about 70% of the time. So we go one, two, three, four. Your turn, John. One, two, three, four. Now I'm gonna randomize it. One, two, three, four, one. No, John, that was two. Let's retrain it. This is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Now you go. One, two, three, four. Now let's mix it up again. I need them to fail every once in a while so that we can retrain it and dial it in. If it's 100% successful, we're not really challenging the brain in a way that it gets better. If they're always failing, it's too complicated for the brain to get any useful information. So in my, in my head, you know, that rough 60 to 70% success rate is what I want. Once you're 80, 90 consistently, I just make it a little bit more difficult.
All right. Now let's get into the good stuff. Not the good, it's all good stuff, but let's talk about that. This, it all has to funnel to this, right? This idea of driving function forward. Um, so this is where the bidirectional relationships live. And I, I, I put function here because our, our, sedentary, our, our patients with persistent pain tend to be pretty sedentary. They're not moving. They have things that they're avoiding. They have changes in their life. They're not doing their hobbies. They're not doing things they love. They're not doing things that challenge the body in a way that creates adaptive changes. So activity levels, those things can correlate with pain. And, and vice versa. Pain coping strategies, self-efficacy, stress, sleep, socialization, diet, hobbies, all of these things have bi-directional relationships with pain. And all of these things, there's value in treating. And the more of these things that we can get functional in our patients, the better our patients with pain are gonna do. So we're gonna use great exposure. We're gonna, we're gonna kind of set up goals to, to in slowly increase function in any of these things. We're gonna look at two different things. One, we're gonna look at great exposure to specific movements because there are specific movements that are gonna limit our ability to do any of this other stuff. If I can only bend forward 10 degrees, my activity levels are gonna be really, really low because I'm super limited. So I've gotta change that. But then we're also gonna use great exposure to general stuff to get after some of these things and start to build programs at driving these things forward. So when we look at great exposure, again, let's go back to our example of the gentleman that gives us 10 degrees of flexion that looks like this. He said, yep, that hurts. And I know if I go any further, it's going to be way worse. And, and we don't have any lumbar reversal here and everything's co-contracted. So what Mosley would say is that, okay, so we look at their baseline and that's what it looks like. And this is a painful or inappropriate motor strategy. So let's change the context. Let's decrease the threat. Let's see if we can change it enough that we flip the script on a mature organism model and allow the patient to move in a more normal way. And we can break the task down into smaller pieces. We can change the context like, uh, you know, so let's say, um, can't give me flexion here. John, go ahead and have a seat, right? That changed it. We took some load out of the spine. It's a little bit different. John, let me see a bend forward. Oh, no, he still doesn't want to give me anything there. So let's change it a little bit more. Let's take more thread out of the system. Let's start all the way at the bottom. John, jump on your, or lay on your back. Awesome. Let's throw a bolster under your legs. You're comfortable there? Yeah, totally. All right, take some deep breaths with me. Awesome. I'm trying to ramp up the parasympathetic nervous system. Maybe I'm distracting him a little bit. Now, John, on this next breath in, I just want you to rock your hips forward. That's not the right cue. I'm saying it on purpose. That's actually going to give me more extension, but I don't want to say the word back purposely. And then when John goes forwards, when he gives me that tilt in this direction, I'm going to say, okay, cool. Now show me the opposite. And then he's going to roll his hips backwards. Right. And what is that? It's a pelvic tilt. I, I'm not talking, I'm not after the TRA. What I'm really trying to do is induce some lumbar flexion without him thinking about it. Right. So John's giving me some, some lumbar flexion. That's awesome. We've decreased the threat enough that he can do that. If that's comfortable, I'm just going to send him home with that. When he comes back next time, let's, what, what we say is now we have an appropriate non-painful strategy for a little bit of flexion. Let's ramp it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase the threat. Let's get rid of that bolster. Now we get maybe a little bit more flexion. Let's bring the knees to chest. Again, that's giving me more lumbar flexion um, without actually him focusing on his back. Once he gets good at that, let's flip him over. Let's do some cat-cow. Again, I'm not saying anything about his back. What I want you to do is arch and sink, arch and sink. And again, what is that? That's more flexion extension movement. From there, maybe we can change the motor strategy, change, or increase the threat and get him into seated and flex. And then maybe some standing flexion holding onto a thing. But really what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down the movement, change the context and change the fear enough that his brain shuts off enough that I can start to fire that movement pattern without the pain and then slowly build it up from there. Does that make sense? Looking for a nod. Cool. Okay. And we can do that with anything. There's lots of ways to break down. One of the, one of the favorite things I love is patients that, that have um, persistent neck pain and won't turn their neck pain past here. Like, awesome. We're going to work on some other stuff for a minute. What I want you to do, and I'll put them in the rolling stool and put a dot on the wall. I'm like, I want to, let, let's just get the lowest part of your spine moving a little bit. So I want you to focus on that dot. And I just want you to walk your feet to the side, but keep your nose pointed to the dot. And what I get is this, right? They gave me 10 degrees of rotation a minute ago, but now I'm getting like 60 because their brain isn't thinking about their neck at all. My brain's thinking about their feet and their hips. 
up. So just another way, or if you want to get shoulder flexion, you have them put their hand on the wall, hold the ball, and let me see, look at the floor and squat. I'm getting flexion above 90, but the patient's not thinking about it, right? There's lots of ways to change the context and distract the patient in ways that we can start to get those movements without the pain. All right, so now let's talk about the other stuff, the bi-directional stuff. This is another kind of whiteboard thing that I frequently will do with patients. Let me see if I can fire this up the first time. Boom. Oh, do we got the whiteboard? Or did we lose it? Can you see the whiteboard? Yeah, okay, cool. So here's the whiteboard. Um, so again, I'll start with this little, oh, there we go. Um, all right, here we go. Still see it? I'm still learning this Zoom whiteboard thing. All right, we there? Looking for a nod. Oh, Brian, um, let me get to Brian's question first, then we'll jump into this. Brian says, do you then point out the difference? E.g., when I said turn your neck, it went to 10 degrees, turning you from below, you went all the way? Not yet. Uh, well, it depends on the patient. Patient that's super fearful, I'm not gonna say anything yet. I'm just gonna send them home with that. We're gonna have them groove that pattern in a bunch. When they come back in, I'm gonna ask them to turn their head and see what they give me. Um, and then from there, depending on the patient, like if the patient's ready to hear it, I'm gonna tell it to them. But if I feel like it's gonna create fear and they're gonna be like, oh shit, you're right, that is turning my neck. And then they're not gonna do it anymore. I might wait and let them get a bunch of reps in first before I let them know that I tricked them a little bit. Plus, I don't want to let, let the cat out of the bag because if like, I'm going to progress the level of the tricks, I don't want them to know that we're tricking them the whole way yet. Okay, cool. Graph number two. Um, going to look like this. And then we go like this. And then I usually put a little tail on the end of it here. We got... I don't know why that's an R, that's pain. I'm terrible at this, that's pain. Um, this bottom one is function, that's gonna go this way. And then we've got time that way. This is right now. And then let's say the, the stuff has been going on for like five years. This is five years ago. So let's start here, John. This is you. And what you've told me is that over the last five years, you've had lots of different providers and everybody has treated your pain. Chiropractors treated your pain, the PT, the acupuncturist, primary care physician, like everything you've done has been focused on doing stuff for your pain. Is that right? John says, yeah, totally. Cool. And the other thing you told me is that ever since this started in the five years of everybody messing with this, your pain has only gotten worse. Is that fair? Totally. And as your pain has gotten worse over the last five years, you've done less and less stuff. You're not at work anymore. You're not jogging. You're not going to the gym. You're not doing the stuff you used to do. And that's just slowly you've done less and less and less over the last five years. Is that fair? Absolutely. Cool. What we're going to do is going to be something a little bit different. Because it wouldn't make any sense for us to do the same thing that everybody's done for you for the last five years. That would be crazy, right? Because it's, it's not gotten you anywhere. What we're going to do is something different. We're going to be the first people that focused here on your function. I'm going to be totally respectful of this, John. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to pay attention to your pain, and, and we're, going to, we're going to be respectful of that. But we're going to focus here. The one thing I can tell you is the better we get this function piece, the more of this we move. It's, it's going to be a bit of a process. But the, the further we can move you down this line, over time, this is going to get better. But this will never get better treating this. It's all the only shot we have at changing your pain is by getting your function forward. It's gonna be very different than anything you've experienced so far. But I, I really believe that if we want a different result, we have to have a different approach. How do you feel about that? That's kind of where I start that conversation, especially for the patient that's either um that, that's either not ready to dive into the pain physiology or doesn't want to hear their damages and pain, or that is is struggling to buy into diving into some of this other stuff. I don't understand why I need to exercise. I don't understand why we got to talk about sleep or whatever. Like this is how I get them to buy into, we've got to do something different if we want a different result. Now, the other thing that's important about this graph, John, is that I want you to see um, 
these are not straight lines, right? These are wavy lines up and down on both sides. And prior to meeting me, well, I'm, I'm just going to guess here. You've got days that are pretty bad. And then you've got days that are not so bad, right? Your, your pain tends to fluctuate. And on the days that are bad, you do less. And the days that are a little bit better, you tend to do a little bit more. Is that fair? Yeah. And it kind of does this wavy, wavy ride that really doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason. Is that fair? Yes. I need you to understand that's not going to change for right now. You're still going to have some of that. So I want you to realize that, that when you have some of those bumps, just like the last five years, it's probably going to have very little to do with the stuff that we did here. And it's just kind of the normal, that's how this kind of pain behaves. So I need you to realize that we're going to have some peaks and valleys along this process. It's nothing to worry about. It sucks when it happens, but it's a normal part of this process. We're going to give you some tricks and some, some tools to kind of work on that, but just realize you're going to have some flares along the way that are different or that, that aren't necessarily have anything to do with the stuff that we're doing in here. We want to normalize the flare-ups up front. They're going to absolutely happen. We're going to give the patient some coping mechanisms for them. They're still going to do their old stuff the first few times, but we've, we've anchored this, and now we have the ability to kind of go back and start talking more about that down the road. Are we cool there? All right. Let's switch um, back to the slides. Ta-da, that was an easy switch. All right, and just like I said, um, I took 15 slides out of this lecture and I'm still gonna go over, but we're getting close to the end. All right, that part will make Alan laugh when he listens to this later. Um, so when we think about, oh, where are my clicks? All my clicks came out, okay. Um, oh, I gotta do this, there we go, okay. So when we think about developing our great exposure plan to, to our, our activities, whether they're the bi-directional relation stuff, stuff, whether they're physical activities, um, it's going to look like this. We have to establish a baseline, and that baseline is going to be based on physical irritability, right? The amount of the aggravating factor takes the flare up, the amount it takes to calm them down. A little bit less cut and dry with these patients, but John's going to let us know, like, you know, if I, if I walk for 10 minutes... Um, my back is so flared up that I'm down for the rest of the day. So it doesn't make sense that we're going to do 15 minutes of anything physical because we're just going to, we're going to throw John into that flare. We've got to be really careful, especially since we just made that speech about flares, that we don't kick him into that thing. So we've got to establish the, the patient's baseline here. Uh, patient's going to pick our tasks and loads of reps time. I'm going to try to get the patient in the driver's seat as much as possible. This is where I like things like the patient-specific functional scale. Say, all right, John, we could flip a switch right now, or uh, what would be different and, and shut your pain off completely? What would, what would you do differently today, next week, next month? What are some of the things that you're not doing that you would get back to? What are some of the things that you're doing now that you struggle with and you can't do as much as, as you could or that as you would like to do? What do you enjoy doing from an activity standpoint? Like, I really want to get them to give me some of those things, and then I'm going to pick some of those things that we're going to start working on. So John wants to get back to walking around the block with his buddies, right? Um, every morning, they, the neighborhood grabs their coffee and they go walk around the block. So John wants to get back to walking. So we got to figure out where do we start with John? John says, you know, uh, John, if you were to walk right now, how long could you walk for? John says, I, I walk for about 10 minutes and then, you know, then I'm pretty much done. Awesome. John says he can walk for 10 minutes. Louis Gifford says, let's take that information and then let's dial it back by half. Does it have to be half? No, but what I want to do is undershoot. I need to set John up for success and I need to minimize the risk of a flare up. So John says, I can walk for 10 minutes. We're going to scale, we're going to scale back the beginning to five. John's got to pick the goal and the timeline. John, how far of a walk do you think is enough? Like, where do you want to be? What, what would make you happy? You know, John says, it takes about 30 minutes. The, the, the guys go out and walk every morning for 30 minutes. I want to do that. Awesome. That's our goal. So, John, if we started today and we started at five minutes, eh, it's built you up a little bit over time. What do you think is reasonable? How long do you think it should take for us to get you from here to that goal of a 30-minute walk that doesn't kick you to a flare? I really want to push John into giving me a number here. Um, 
I'm going to try to get John to give me something. John, it's, it's going to take some work. John's, John doesn't have very good internal locus of control here, but I'm going to try to get something out of him. John, if I can, can squeeze four weeks out of John, I'm going to dial it back and say, okay, John, let's make it six. Just want to, just want to give us plenty of time to work on this. We're probably going to get there before that. And then if we under promise and over deliver, that gives us even more therapeutic alliance. If we overshoot and flare John up right off the bat, that robs us of therapeutic alliance. Small little successes along the way will build hope. Hope is currency, which allows us to buy more therapeutic alliance, which allows, uh, gets us buying the program, gets us more, uh, more capital in creating behavior change, gets us the ability to drive function forward even more. Right? So I want to make sure that I'm setting tiny little goals that John can crush because in the last decade, John has succeeded at nothing. Right? I have to reverse that. I have to get John to believe that he has the ability to change. So by, by picking the correct objective comparables, by figuring out what are the things that John's interested in changing, and then setting up small, tiny little goals that John can meet along the way, I start to build this environment where we shift John's hope to drive things forward. So now we're going to talk about this for a second, and then we'll, we'll close this show down here. So last little whiteboard video, or yeah, last little whiteboard thing here. Um, let's throw this out. This is the other one that I probably use most often with patients. So when we're talking about, uh, where'd it go? Hmm. There we go. Can we see oh, what's, what's happening here? All right. Let me do this one more time. Let's go here. Share. And here. I would probably bet on time if I knew how to use Zoom better. Okay. Clearly doesn't want to work for me. Okay, that's all right. Let's do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this out on my whiteboard. I'm going to, I'm going to start and I'm going to write the word pain in the middle and I'm going to circle it. And then I'm going to go back to John's subjective. And John, I just want to kind of review some of the stuff you talked about. And this is going to correlate with kind of the lines I drew that drive sensitivity up in that in the pain alarm system thing. So John, some of the things you mentioned to me were sleep. You're not sleeping real well. You brought up your diet that's not going real well. And you're having a little bit of anxiety and you're not doing a lot of activity. Um, all of these things have, have a, a relationship with pain and pain makes those things worse, but those things also make pain worse. So it's important for us to get after some of those things. Of those things that you mentioned, John, which of those do you feel like is most important or, or, or is most important to your pain? You know, and maybe John's gonna give me something here and John's gonna say, you know, I, I, I think that the nights that I sleep bad, I'm pretty terrible the next day. Awesome, let's talk about sleep a little bit. So now we're gonna dive into that sleep thing and I'm gonna have, um, I, I've got like a sleep hygiene list printed out sitting, on the, sitting in the corner that I'm just gonna grab. So John, let's go through this list of, of things in here. This is, there's been some really cool research, but when we look at people that sleep well, that have good restorative sleep, you know, this is the, these are the commonalities between everybody, these 11 things. So I'm gonna go through this list with you. Let's take a look at this list. And we go through each item. John, which of these things do you feel like you do really, really well? I want to start with the good, right? So he gives me three or four things. We're going to cross those off. Of these things, which do you feel like you don't do well at all? Okay, so we're going to circle those. Of those four things that you don't do well, which do you think is probably most disruptive to your sleep? Okay, that's interesting. Which of these things do you feel like you are most ready to work on or you feel like you, you'd like, you'd like some, some, some tips or tricks to work on? Awesome. Cool. So whatever he picked, that's good. What? Because there are things that I think about, like like the 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 consistent sleep wake time. That's huge. The getting rid of light ninety minutes before. I think that's huge too. Um, but John may not think that that's huge. And if John has a thing that he would rather work on, um, we're gonna have way more success going after the thing he picked than the thing I picked. So I'm gonna let him pick it. John. Okay. Do you wanna? 
You want to work on not eating within 90 minutes of bed. Fantastic. How often do you think you do that wrong? Pretty much every night? Okay, cool. So let's do this. Over the next week, what do you think about, what if we said you're just going to three days next week, you're going to be done eating at this time? So how's that feel, right? So I'm going to use that to, to kind of, um, Jess Anderson, where can we get a sleep hygiene list? I will, um, I'll throw a resource in the Facebook page right after this call. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. If you Google sleep hygiene list, you'll see a lot of stuff, but there's one that I use, um, frequently that's, it, it's old now. It came from the Stanford sleep hygiene group. Um, out of Stanford University. And the only reason I use it is because it says Stanford University or Stanford Medicine or something at the top. And um, when people see that, they're like, oh, Stanford, that's an important place, right? So you get, a, a, it, it's kind of a little like con external contextual seed that I plant without actually saying anything where they look at that. Cause I could, I could put something together and put my logo on it, but nobody knows who I am. But everybody, when I show them that they're like, oh, Stanford. That, that's important. Um, so I'll throw that in there for you. But that's kind of how I'm going to build that out. And we can build that out in any of these things. I, I showed you the activity one, that's sleep. Um, if they say depression is a thing, we're going to talk about depression and we're going to talk about, have they sought care for that before? Have they, had, uh, have they had any treatment? If yes, did it go well? What was good? What was bad? And then I, I know some pain psychologists in my area that if, we're, if that's a thing that the patient is ready to work on, then we're going to talk about it. If anxiety is the thing, we're going to talk about how, how stress and anxiety can drive up the nervous system. And we're going to talk about ruminating behaviors and we're going to talk about stress reduction techniques and mindfulness techniques. We're going to figure out things that patients are willing to try. And then we're going to set up some goals and then we're going to check in on them just like anything else. Um, but as many of these, I, I tend to on the front end, I try to get after like one activity thing and one thing outside of activity to start building the program. And then as they have small successes, then we start to, as John nails one of those sleep hygiene things, then we'll pick another one that he didn't do. And once he has that success and he feels, he sees it change, then we say, okay, John, you, you're doing really good at this one. You had two more that, that weren't great. Which one of these do you want to add into the program now? Realize that our great exposure program isn't just great exposure to this stuff. And it isn't just great exposure to activity or movement. It's also designed to be great exposure to shifting from external to internal self, uh, locus of control. It's great exposure to self-efficacy. What I really need to, the patient to do is take control of themselves again. They need to shift the control out of the medical system and back to themselves. And this is, uh, the, the, the subtext to all of this is training patients how to do that as well. Cool. All right. So let's close the show here. Take homes. The big things to think about when we treat these patients is on the front end, we have to identify and address yellow flags that are contributing to pain states or barriers to progress. All the psychosocial stuff, beliefs and expectations are wildly important. We're gonna get after them by educating patients on neurophysiology, but on all the other stuff as well. And this is not a standalone treatment and it's not a one and done thing. We have to build it up over time at an appropriate level for each patient. The goal, they don't have to be able to tell, they, they never have to hear the word periodontal break. That doesn't matter. What we have to do is validate their experience, create a narrative that normalizes their symptoms to do the de-threatened stuff and instill hope so that we can crack the door on the other stuff. Graded, if we're going to use graded motor imagery stuff, which in some patients is important, realize the order matters. We can't move to motor imagery until laterality is good. We can't move to mirrors until we can get through those things well and without increasing symptoms. We think about graded exposure. It's got to be patient directed. Yes, it's about building their function, but it's also about building their self-efficacy and teaching them how to establish goals, meet goals, and progress function. We have to focus on that function. We also want to make sure that patients are absolutely always going to flare up, and that first flare-up is going to be terrifying. But if we had that conversation about flare-ups before the first one happens, it normalizes it a little bit. It gives us the opportunity to bring them back down off the ledge. 
not all cases need everything. Not every centrally dominant patient through the door needs laterality training, two-point discrimination training, a bunch of education, some mindfulness and deep breathing techniques, some great exposure to flexion and seven different uh, bi-directional stuff. We have to really dive into the patient, figure out what are the most dominant features of their pain and address those with the idea being that we want to make sure that we're picking the things that we know we've got that's gonna change an objective measure or the patient's gonna be able to see change early on and that we're fairly confident we're gonna have early success. We need to knock out a bunch of tiny little goals early on to build as much hope capital as possible. Always, always, always thinking about language and context to reduce fear and increase hope. I am the most positive human in the world in the clinic. Everything I say is going to be, this is going to give a God, that looks so much better. Man, after we do this thing, you're going to feel better. There's so much positivity that jumps out of my mouth into the patient's head all day long because I know what I'm trying to do is get into your, your prefrontal cortex to jumpstart that periaqueductal gray to turn down the volume on the information coming up from your body. Beliefs and expectations, the foundation that outcomes are built on all day long. We have to, if when we identify patients that are hopeless, that don't expect any change on a therapy, and the beliefs about their body are poor, this is a very important treatment target. We're not going to change it day one, but this has to be an underlying goal with everything we do. All right, that is all I got. 15 minutes late, not bad. Thoughts, questions, concerns from anybody? Hey, I have a, a quick question over here. Um, just wonder how you might shift a I mean, this is the, the therapeutic alliance, I guess, but how you might shift a patient who is just hyper focused on, I'll call them the orthopedic factors, you know, that back pain patient who they know they have no hip internal rotation and they never have, they know they have no extension. Um, they've been told they, not just MRI findings, but they're so focused on all of these impairments that they're, they're not willing to try anything else outside of that. Yeah, absolutely. Got a couple, couple things that, that I'm going to think about that patient. The first one, and this is kind of with everybody, we talk about that through ICE, we talk a lot about the concept of physical irritability, right? The idea of how much, figuring out the balance between how much of an aggravating factor it takes to kick you up and how much of an easing factor it takes to calm you down. And, you know, that high irritability patient is going to take a very little bit of stimulus to flare up and to take them forever to calm down and vice versa. Um, I like to think about this concept that we just made up, you're not going to find it in a textbook anywhere, called psychological irritability. Same kind of idea. How ingrained is the patient in their current beliefs, and how powerful is my alliance with that patient versus their alliance with the people that are putting those beliefs in their head, and how much can I challenge your beliefs before you're going to kind of dig in, the energy's gonna change, we're gonna switch body postures, we're gonna break eye contact, that kind of stuff. Because when that happens, you're gonna, you're gonna when, when you get to a position where you feel like you're on the defensive, you're only gonna entrench yourself more in those beliefs, right? So I've gotta, I've gotta get a good feeling of that and not push harder than you're willing to be pushed. Now, the patient you're describing, to me, is a high psychological irritability patient. If I say, listen, your internal rotation doesn't matter. We need to get blah, blah, blah. Your energy is whatever. That's, they're just going to be like, no, this is the way it is. This is, that's fine. What we're gonna do, I'm probably going to measure some stuff that doesn't matter that I know is going to look good, right? You know, Doris, those hips aren't moving great, but you've got some, watching you get up and down on that chair, watching you step on that, you've, you've got some strength that you've got some stuff that we can work with, right? So instead of giving you an impairment list, I'm going to give you a what's looking good list. This gives me a foundation of things to build from. The other thing I'm going to do with Doris is like, here's the deal. I know you got this stuff going on, but what I know for sure is that if we were, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to lean on that function versus pain graph. Um, what I know is that if we can drive some of this functional stuff forward, it's going to change. Doris, if you could get back to walking for 30 minutes and your hip internal rotation was still five degrees, would that matter? No. Right. So what I really want to do is try to get her to, I'm not going to argue with her about her impairments, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk to her about, we're, we're, that's, that's great. What we're going to do is we're going to work on function. We're going to try to you know, hit the PSFS. Like what is the thing that you would, if you had that internal rotation, 
what would you what would you do with it and then whatever she answers to that cool we're going to work on that thing and then if i can show you a change in that thing you know, walking gardening whatever and we're going to measure it right psfs zero you can't do it 10 no problem at all she says it's a one and then we do some things that are going to make changes in that and we actually show her that those things change Doris isn't going to care about her hip internal rotation anymore because she's getting back to the things she wants. So if I can demonstrate a change in function, I start to divorce her from the impairment. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? I'm happy to hang out forever. I got nothing going on until uh, Thursday. Uh, yeah, I got a, I got a question on a great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about like tips and techniques for kind of walking back when you, when you do overstep with that kind of therapeutic alliance um, boundary or when like the expectation that you're kind of like expecting their response to be when you're trying to give them that locus of control doesn't line up. So like, for example, um, I have a persistent pain patient right now who um, I was kind of trying to show her, she recognized in herself that her pain doesn't make sense that she'll pick up a case of water at the grocery store, no pain, but like bending over to put on sheets it'll flare her up. And I was trying to ask her like, why do you think that is kind of like leading down that, you know, um, you know, pain doesn't equal tissue damage. And she goes, well, I think it's because I'm really thinking about bracing and I do a good job of setting my transverse anomalous. Like she, she went through a really mechanically based um, treatment protocol before. So she kind of thinks that that doesn't happen because, you know, during lighter stuff, she's not focused on that. And that's why it flares her up. So it was completely opposite of what I was expecting and kind of made some logic from her perspective to where I really didn't even know where to go and kind of just stepped back and kind of avoided and went with one of those, all right, next step um, kind of thing. So I was just wondering if you could talk to that, like what, how you would handle that situation. Yeah. So it depends on the patient. So if the patient's a little bit lower on psychological irritability, like she's, she, she's willing to engage a little bit. She's not super tied in. I might say, okay, so we pick the box up at the grocery store. You're thinking about it. You're braced and that's okay. You tie your shoe and that hurts and it's because you're not braced. So what happens if you brace and you tie your shoe? I'm just asking a question. Just say, I, I don't know. Try it. <laughs> and then let's just see what happens. What I, what, so this is, this, this is kind of like stealing from the motivational interviewing stuff, right? I don't want to be aggressive about it, but I want you to, I want to kind of guide you to identifying your own discrepancy, right? It, that's a very easily showable thing. If that's the thing, then she should just be able to do what she does at the grocery store, consciously think about it, try her shoe in front of you. If it's still an issue, then that's got to trigger something in her brain to go, well, shit, why didn't that, why didn't that work? Let's talk about that a little bit. Right. So, so what you want to do is try to, I don't want to tell you why I want you to try to identify why like, all right, well, let's try that. See what happens. Okay. So that didn't work. Why, why do you think that is? Um, yeah, that's kind of what I would go with her. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, no problem. Any other things? Keep them coming. Hey, I got I got one more. Sorry for. Yeah, please. No, don't be sorry. Send it. I, I, I'm not sure maybe how to phrase this, but you know, it's it's how to determine maybe what is the most um, what's the most dominating feature of of the patient's pain because that that can be challenging because I think sometimes we might fall in the trap of just because someone's had pain a long time that they're going to be centrally sensitized, which, you know, I've seen patients that that is the case, but other patients, they just maybe got a poor diagnosis or were just doing the equivalent of, of uh, you know, banging their head against the wall on a, a nociceptive problem that they didn't know what was triggering it. And a little digging deeper allowed us to, to remove some of those triggers or treat it a little more appropriately. And so I just, maybe that's not even a question, but, you know, is there anything else other than what you shared about, you know, how, to determine what is most important, you know, in that moment for that patient. Yeah, it starts here. If it's um, 
<clears throat> the patient, can you still see my screen? Okay, cool. Yeah, I think it starts here. Like this is, this is where we start to kind of build the hypothesis, right? If the patient, if the patient has this stuff going on, right? If the patient's, if this has been going on for 10 years, but it's in a very dermatomal pattern and this turns it on and this shuts it off and the kind of, and this is super tenser, tender and this is not. And if I flick you here and it zings down into your fingers, right? Even though it's been going on for 15 years, it's probably, and, and maybe you've got some psychosocial stuff going on with it. It's probably more likely that the neuropathic stuff is more dominant. Whereas if the other stuff, and we've got a lot of allodynia on board and it's more of a widespread thing and there's some psychosocial components and kind of that other stuff, like this is where, this is where we start. So, so I see this stuff and then if I'm, if I'm like, oh, is this more neuropathic? Is this more centrally dominant? Then I'm going to dive in and maybe I'll look at, I'll look at some, I'll look at, you know, start looking at some of that, uh, some of the, well, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, you know, some of the things from both of these and figure out, okay, well, as I go through this objective exam, looking at both of these things, what are the things that stand out the most? Is it are the things that are more powerful stand on the centrally dominant side or the things that are more powerful on the neuropathic side? But if it's, you know, it's going to be, for the ones that are close, it's going to be a combination of this stuff and this stuff. But then again, if I'm still kind of torn as to what are the most important pieces if it's, if it's really that hard for me to tease out between the two, then it's probably likely that these things are relatively closely weighted. So then at that stage, what we're going to do is if we look at this stuff and we listen to the patient, what are the, because we can't go after all of it at once. So what are the things that I can go after that one, I can demonstrate an objective change, whether it's through stuff on the left column or the right column. So one, that I can demonstrate an objective change, but two, what is the thing that the patient is most likely to buy into and do? Because if, I, if they're pretty close and I'm like, you know, I really want to get after this neurodiet, or if they're pretty, let's, let's do it probably more realistic way, right? If, it, if they're pretty close and I really think that I, if I could just calm the nervous system down a bit and I would love to get after some deep breathing techniques and the patient's like, I'm not into that woo-woo shit. Um, and they would be more likely to do this kind of thing for a little bit. Um, then let's jump there. Let's, let, let, let's show them a little bit of a change. Let's get some therapeutic alliance. Let's show them some of that, that early, on, um, early on objective change. And then maybe we can get into some of those other spheres. But at the end of the day, the patient doesn't buy it and they're not willing to do it. It doesn't really matter what I decided anyway. So if they're close, let's default with the thing that the patient is most willing to do. And then a thing that I've, I've done an objective measure that I can show change in early on. Cool. That's super helpful. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Wonderful. Anything else? Hey, um, yeah. Okay. You go first. I have one. All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go. John first, I think he spoke first, and then we'll jump into Megan. Sorry. Um, so what about the kind of the patient who's seen, you know, like a neurologist or something like that, where, you know, they've kind of got that, you know, that extensive educational, you know, background a little bit, um, you know, more dialed in as far as some of that kind of stuff goes. And then they come to you and they're a little pessimistic about, you know, what could maybe go on. How do you, how do you approach that kind of? As in they're pessimistic about PT. Right. Yeah. Probably because they've had it before and they failed. And like the neurologist is like, yeah, you know, we need to do this, but we can't do it unless you do four weeks of PT first. That kind of patient. Yeah. And it's like, uh, well, the brain's complex. We don't really know why this or that might be going on. And they kind of. Oh, yeah. Negative stuff going totally. that way. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's when I like some of that whiteboard stuff, right? I, I totally agree that the brain is, the brain is super complex. We don't know exactly what's going on. And there's a million studies that come out that show us lots of different stuff all the time. What we do know for sure, as we step back and look at the thousand foot view, these are the things that drive up that nervous system stuff. These are all the stuff that, that, that can, that can affect that. And while we don't know what's going on in the brain, what we do know is that 
as we change these things, as we build the healthy behaviors around these things, your brain changes, your nervous system changes, your pain changes, right? So instead of focusing on that specific neurophysiologic stuff, what I know for sure is I don't know how it works. The one thing I do know is that if we can change A, B, and C, A, B, and C will change your experience. Which of these things do you feel like you're ready to work on? Always try to, always try to shift it to the behaviors we need to change. Does that make sense? Excellent. Thank you. Cool. The other thing, let me, let me one last note on that because we do get those patients that are like, yeah, you know, I, I'm only here because um, the thing I need next, I, the, the insurance won't pay for unless I do six weeks of PT or whatever. I'm not, early on, I'm not going to press that at all. Like, awesome. Well, I'm glad you're here because the one thing I do know is that the stronger we get you, the more mobile we get you, the more healthy we get you, whatever my targets are. Um, the, the better we can improve those things now, the better your outcomes will be after X, whether X is a surgery or a shot or whatever, right? And I don't believe that at all. What I want to do is convince you that you don't need the thing, but I'm not going to do that today. What I'm going to do today is tell you that, cool, since you're here, the, most, the, the more that we can do here, the better that thing's going to be in four weeks. Let me measure some stuff. And then here's some things to work on. And then I'm going to do everything I can to demonstrate objective change in that first week. We see some things. Next week, we're going to change it a little bit more. And then next week, I might start talking about, you know, this has been going on for a long time. Have you seen any of this stuff change? No, oh, this is cool. All right, let's run down this path. I'm just planting a little bit of seeds. Now week three, I'm going to start saying, you know, We've seen some improvements that you haven't seen in a long time. What do you think about maybe we kick the can down the road on this procedure a little bit and run down this path a little bit more? We know this is cheaper. This is going well. Things are improving. Let's, let's just table. How do you feel about tabling that for a little bit and, and, and trying this a little bit more? Um, and then if they're into that, you know, we go a little bit further and I say, you know, things are looking pretty good here. Do you really want to risk that surgery? Do you really want to risk that shot? What if we just did this until it plateaued, right? I will tell you, I definitely had that approach with lots of patients. Some patients have said I'm crazy. Some patients have gone on to get their surgery. Some patients I've saved the surgery, right? You're not going to, this is never going to be 100%, but you will, if, if you do it that way, there'll be some patients that you talk out of a thing that they don't need but you'll never, ever, ever do it on day one. Um, and it's, it, it, and on day one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on the surgeon's therapeutic line and say, awesome, Dr. Jones is fantastic. I'm glad you're here. What Dr. Jones knows is that the best that we can do here, the best you're going to do in that surgery. And then three weeks later, I'm going to try to steal money out of jo Dr. Jones' pocket. But right now, I gotta, I'm going to use him to get you to buy into what we're doing. And then once I got that buy-in, I'm going to try to convince you that you don't need it. Referral sources don't like me much. All right, Kathleen, or Megan, sorry. Hey, yeah, no worries. Uh, thank you so much, really good information. Um, my question was regarding, like I don't have as much experience maybe incorporating like the graded motor imagery stuff. Yeah. And I was just curious, like which, like, I guess where, which patients do you find that most beneficial with? And like, when do you discern, like, maybe I should go down this route a little bit? Yeah. So if, if we're in, if, if we're primary centrally dominant, we've got some, uh, some kind of that, that widespread, like stuff is just coming from everywhere. I hurt my back five years ago and it was like left-sided low back and into my leg a little bit, but here we are five years later and it's my whole back and it's my neck and like it's everything. Um, I'm starting to think that we've got some location discrimination. Like we don't know where information is coming from. We start to see some of that allodynia stuff. So I'm starting to think that we've got some, um, some of those neuroplastic changes in the brain that doesn't allow me to know where stuff is coming from. So I'm going to test it. Let's look at laterality. Let's look at two point discrimination. If I see deficits in those things, then graded motor imagery is definitely where I'm going. Um, from a demographic standpoint, CRPS, almost always graded motor imagery is 
is the place that we're going to go in that order. Some of the chronic back pain stuff with allodynia, sometimes we see deficits there, sometimes we don't. Um, if your laterality looks great, your two-point discrimination looks great, and it's more widespread, I might shift into other stuff thinking about um, is this more a gross movement thing? Are we looking at um, uh, great exposure to specific movements, things like that? Um, but if it's more chronic centrally and like a unilateral thing, um, graded motor imagery tends to live pretty high. Now, again, it can go either way, but those are sort of like the indicators that I'm going to look for. And then, you know, and then we start running down that road. And if it's not changing anything, and the anything I'm looking, I'm, I'm never looking for changes in resting pain up front. That's not, that's not my target. My target is, am I making changes in laterality? Am I making changes in two-point discrimination? Am I like making changes in gross movement? Um, and if those things are changing, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to continue running down that road. If we're not changing those things, then I got to change my approach. Is that good? You want more? You got a follow-up question? Megan, awesome. Thanks. Okay, cool. Wonderful. Good stuff. Anything else? Cool. Love it. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out. Um, again, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I went long, sorry, but um, I can talk about this stuff all the time. Um, for graded motor imagery stuff, there's some really good resources on um, the NOI website, NOI, I can't remember what it stands for, but that's Mosley and Butler's group. Um, we go into a little bit more detail on it in ICE's pain course. Um, we kind of build out all this stuff a bit more, uh, but there's some good references and stuff out there. Um, Feel free to check them out if you if you look if you're looking for more in-depth stuff for for some of this. Feel free to shoot me a message. I'm happy to give you give you some ideas for where to dig some more of this stuff out. Um, otherwise, thanks for hanging out, and um, Alan will get the slides out to you all probably in the morning. So have an awesome night, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thanks so much. This was great. Have a great night. Thank you. Now let's figure out how to stop this.